Before we start this video, I would like to make another appeal to all of our viewers. Please do subscribe to The Print. We have some really nicely done exclusive content that is for our subscribers only. This includes science videos such as pure science and even articles that we write are possible only because of your generous help. Please do consider subscribing to The Print. Let's move on to the pure science video now. It's nearly time. In less than a week, Chandrayaan-3 is going to land at the south pole of the moon. It has already descended to its final orbit around the moon and the landing attempt is scheduled to take place on the 23rd of August. If India succeeds in performing this soft landing and getting its lander on the surface, it will only be the fourth country to do so after the US, the USSR and China. Both Chandrayaan-3 and Russia's Luna 25 are planning to land in the Southern Hemisphere in the South Pole region and the sites were picked for crucial reasons. No country has ever landed before in the South Pole region of the Moon. If all goes well, next week onwards, we'll have two landers at the South Pole barely about 100 kilometers away from each other, exploring a part of the Moon that scientists have wanted access to for decades. The Moon is covered in craters. This is especially true for the far side of the Moon that doesn't face us and the South Pole. Here, in the South Pole, there are patches of land with water ice on it, as was confirmed by the impactor from Chandrayaan-1 that hit the Moon's surface at the South Pole region. In this region, because of the axis and the tilt of the Moon, there are areas in craters that are in permanent shadows. Inside some craters, given their depth and angle, some parts are never ever exposed to the sun. There are also parts that are permanently exposed to the sun and in sunlight. But these kind of shadowy craters is what we are interested in scientifically because they are basically planetary fossils. They contain water, hydrogen and other volatiles that have frozen to become ice and those were present during the early days of the solar system. So exploring this region gives us an insight into what exactly was happening in the very early days when the moon formed. Such regions of space foils are called cold traps. Understanding cold traps gives us a better idea of what the Earth-Moon system was like millions of years ago. Both the bodies, Earth and Moon, were bombarded by comets and asteroids in the past, so they contain material from these space rocks. And on the Moon, there is also evidence of chemical reaction with the solar wind on the lunar soil or regolith. Most importantly, the South Pole contains both water ice and hydroxyl ions. Hydroxyl ions form water, they are the OH family, and water ices are evidence of molecular water. So the discovery of these, which indicates the presence of water, and just happened in the last decade or so, has led to a lot of missions being planned to the South Pole and a lot of renewed interest among astronomers and planetary scientists towards the lunar South Pole. There, in fact, is also a form of magnetic anomaly present here where parts of the crust or the surface of the Moon is magnetized while the rest is not. These are all the things that both these missions will hope to understand and explain. The South Pole Aitken Basin is one of the largest known impact craters in the solar system and it is the oldest, deepest and largest crater on the moon. It is so deep that it is basically a basin. As there are craters, there are also mountains. Epsilon Peak here is taller than Mount Everest. But we are mostly concerned with water ice. Chandrayaan-3 and Luna-25 are landing near craters called Manzanus and Boguslawski, both are named after European astronomers who studied comets and elements and refined astronomical instruments. These craters are actually not simple single craters. Astronomers have basically recreated the sky system on the surface of the moon and each crater has satellite craters that are near and around it. Manzanus in fact has over 20 satellite craters all named with a letter after the name Manzanus. Chandrayaan-3 will work with Chandrayaan-2 that is currently orbiting the moon. Chandrayaan-2 has already helped a great deal by scouring the moon for locations and data from Chandrayaan-2 orbiter definitely helped in picking the landing site for Chandrayaan-3. But when Chandrayaan-3 is on the moon, it will use Chandrayaan-2 orbiter for communication. 
And this isn't an option for Russia, by the way. Luna 25 is only a lander and rover without an orbiter. These are two missions for now, but there are going to be plenty in the future. China's Chang'e 7 mission will also land at the South Pole, while NASA's Artemis 3, which will be a future crewed lunar mission, will see humans at the lunar South Pole for the very first time. But why is everything the very first time with the Lunar South Pole? We have been exploring the moon since 1959 and there have been so many landing attempts. In fact, there have been a total of 15 uncrewed landings and 6 missions that have seen humans walk on the moon. Why didn't any of them go to the South Pole directly? The previous season of rapid lunar exploration with lots of lunar activity was during the Cold War. Both US and USSR were dying to win the race for space and they were vying for speed records. Who does what first? So they all landed near and around the equatorial region of the moon in a region that is now roughly called the Apollo zone. The equatorial region makes it easy and in fact the easiest to land and take off from the moon and to establish a line of communication with Earth. But over the last few decades, there have been lots of scientific developments and we know so much more about the moon now and we know it so much better than we did back then. There were no soft landings on the moon at all from 1976 to 2013 and now we know even better where to go, what we want to explore and why. So why? It's not like there's going to be life on the moon. There is no atmosphere and the moon is dead. So why do we care if there's water on the moon? The moon is going to be our next step to establish a human base. We already have the Artemis and the Chang'e missions that have begun this process and we're only going to be seeing more and more settlement on the moon over the next few decades. Hypothetically, from the moon, launches can be easier as there is less gravity to contend with and astronomy can be so much more better and accurate as there is no atmospheric interference. To establish a scientific base like this, lunar water could actually be collected and used for drinking and other human activities. It can be used to create oxygen and also to create fuel as oxygen and hydrogen are the prime components of rocket fuel. This in turn will reduce overall costs. Water can also be used for indoor soil and agriculture. It can be used for generating power on the moon. And for the immediate future, it can yield a lot of information about our solar system's past. The presence of water will also greatly help mine for other minerals and material in outer space if it can be used as both sustenance and fuel. Water is usually referred to by commercializers as the oil of space and that is indeed how it works. In the far future too, our system will very much be along the lines of the expanse where air and water are so much more precious than oil and gold. The presence of water any where boosts the need for exploring the region and when it comes to the moon for settling there. Material can also be transported from the moon to Earth and in fact it would become extremely cheap when reusable rockets become the norm. Flying to low Earth orbit from the moon is considerably cheaper than flying to low Earth orbit from Earth. And scientists commonly believe that in the future there might be fueling stations orbiting in the low Earth orbit for vehicles in transit. However, before all of the sci-fi future can become reality, there will be policies and laws that will need to come into place about who can own what resources on the moon. And even before that, we are going to be privy now, in the immediate future, to a series of spacecraft that are going to be sending back findings from the moon, which no matter what the findings are, will still be enough reason to send more craft and more people to the moon in this century. 